we've been talking about our solar system and the first couple of weeks we talked about the inner planets and now we're going to be talking about the outer planets. Inner planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then the outer planets are going to be Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And as you can see, uh, and nobody ever says it, Saturn, if you count the ring, is bigger than Jupiter. But nobody counts the ring. And give it a, oh, about another 300 million years, uh, Saturn won't even have a ring. So that's kind of sad. But if you want to get some perspective of how everything looks relative to each other, uh, there you go. The Earth is 8,000 miles across. Jupiter is about 88,000 miles across. So that'll give an idea how big Jupiter is compared to the Earth. It's like comparing a watermelon to a cherry. And we all know what happens when you drop a watermelon on a cherry. Now, if you take a look, if you actually get a scale and you put Jupiter on one side and the rest of the planets on the other side, you'll find that Jupiter outweighs twice all the other planets combined. Now, because of this immense gravity, Jupiter has been blamed for a lot of things. One of the things it was blamed for was the coming disaster that was supposed to happen in March of 1982. Do all of you remember that terrible disaster that we had in 1982? Nobody remembers it. Well, of course, that was the Jupiter effect. That's where the gravity of Jupiter was going to destroy the Earth. Um, we're still waiting for it. And to tell you the truth, the gravitational effect of Jupiter on us would be about comparable as a mosquito landing on your wrist. However, there's a lot of other things that Jupiter is being blamed for. One of the things is the fact that Jupiter supposedly affects Earth's climate. And where they get this from is the orbit of, of uh, Jupiter actually pulls on the sun. As a result, the Barry Center, or the center of gravity that the Earth goes around, actually adds about another, oh, about another million miles or so to the distance between the Earth and the sun. So as a result of that, there are times when possibly the, uh, because of the distance to the sun, our climate changes. But, pro but probably the most uh, uh, effect that Jupiter is known for is the fact that it does affect asteroids and comets and stuff, it will pull or actually at least change the orbits of comets and asteroids, uh, thereby probably saving the Earth from more destruction. But the other side works as well, where uh, according to some scientists, Jupiter may have been responsible for the asteroid to hit the Earth and uh, cause the uh, uh, the dinosaurs to disappear. So the dinosaurs were pretty angry at that, uh, except for one little mammal there on the bottom that was egging Jupiter on and gave an interesting prediction of what will happen in the future. Now, as, as we sit here, there is, an, uh, there is a probe that is orbiting Jupiter. The name of that probe is Juno. And Juno is the largest satellite that actually uses solar cells. Uh, those, as you can see, they are quite considerable in size. 
And the reason for that is because we're running out of plutonium, which is what they use for the nuclear thermogenerators on uh, satellites that go uh, beyond where the sun could uh, power, uh, actually where you know, the sun could power solar cells. So Juno at the present time is uh, orbiting the giant planet. It was sent up August 5th, 2011. <clears throat> and as a as a move to get the most out of this particular probe, it was uh, sent in an orbit that would actually use the Earth's gravity as a booster to get it all the way out to Jupiter. When it finally got out to Jupiter, uh, keep in mind it took five years to get there, which is about half the life of my refrigerator and the and it still has another 10 years of research i don't think my refrigerator could possibly uh last more than 10 years and this one's going to last close to 20. um anyway when i got to jupiter it actually fell in between the uh the radiation belts and the planet as a result in the process of diving in between the radiation belts. It achieved a velocity of over 135,000 miles per hour. It was the fastest thing in our solar system while it was passing Jupiter. While it did that, it took a number of pictures, uh, not only of Jupiter, but also of the moons as it made this highly elliptical orbit. Learned, a quite, learned quite a bit about the moons and about the planet itself. One of the things you can see as far as technology is concerned, uh, well, actually one of the things that will happen, uh, sometime around uh, 2022, it will actually dip into the atmosphere of Jupiter and be destroyed. So that'll be the end of the mission. But with the advancement of technology came the advancement of, well, picture taking. As you can see, the difference in the, uh, what was that, the 27 and 20, uh, so about, about 40 some odd years, you can see that there's been a considerable distance in imaging. And uh, the other thing you can see a big difference with is the size of the red spot. So you can tell that Jupiter is changing. We don't know exactly why it's changing. Uh, some scientists believe that the sun's output is actually increasing. And so it is changing some of the aspects that the planets are going through. One thing that Juno and before that Galileo learned, the probe Galileo, was the fact that the weather on Jupiter works the same way as the weather on the Earth, which is pretty hard to believe, considering that the temperature uh, well inside the atmosphere of Jupiter is pretty close to that of, a, of the surface of a star. So you wonder, where is the similarity? And the similarity comes with the fact that with any planet, uh, the heat is always more at the equator and the heat rises at the equator, will migrate toward the poles and then move over the surface of the planet back to the equator. This is known as a Hadley cell. So it'll rise at the equator move uh, toward the poles where at the poles, the cool air will fall to the planet and then move back toward the equator again. And now it gets complicated because the earth is actually rotating. So when the earth rotates, 
basically everything gets really, really complicated due to something called the Coriolis effect. And as a result of that, it breaks up the Hadley cell into uh, bands. And these bands will actually go in opposite directions. Another name for these bands are the trade winds. And very experienced sailors would sail, uh, would actually change their latitude in order to catch these headwinds or tailwinds, trade winds, in order to get where they're going. And you can see that in this, in this uh, time lapse picture of the trade winds, you can see how they go in opposite directions. Well, Jupiter is doing exactly the same thing. As you can see, as you go from one band to another, uh, the direction will actually change. And if we take a look at, at the bands and in particular, you can see that some of these bands will move pretty close to oh, somewhere around 500 kilometers per hour, which is about uh, just under 400 miles per hour, and they'll move in opposite directions. The picture on top was that of Voyager uh, 1, and as you can see, well, what, it, what it did was it actually took a picture every 10 and a half hours uh, so that it would catch the same part of Jupiter every time it came around. So all you're looking at is the uh, or the winds, the bands moving uh, on the planet itself. Now Jupiter rotates. It's actually it's the fastest rotating planet in our solar system. The rotational time is about nine and a half hours. And at the equator, it'll actually move, actually spin at about twenty-two thousand miles per hour. So when you have something that is not quite, uh, shall we say, not quite a solid, and you spin it real fast, what happens? Well, if it was made out of jello, it would probably send pieces of jello all over the room. Well, in the case of Jupiter, as it moves at 22,000 miles per hour at the equator, Jupiter will actually go oblong. So uh, yeah, so Jupiter is not a round planet. It's more, well, oblong. Now, if we take a look at the planets uh, in our solar system, we can see that there's the Earth and Mars uh, moving around 24 hours for one rotation. But take a look at Jupiter and Saturn. And as you can see, Jupiter moves at about uh, nine, almost 10 hours for one rotation, while Saturn will move at about 10 and uh, two thirds uh, hours for one rotation. What's really weird, take a look at Uranus. Uranus is lying over on its side and it spins uh, with one rotation at 17 hours, 14 minutes. Well, we'll talk about that next week. Um, we'll talk about how weird a year would be on Uranus, because that would be a really weird year. Anyway, uh, so if we're looking at the winds on another planet, uh, as it rotates, it'll set up these bands or these trade winds. And all of the giant planets in fact, all the planets will actually show some aspect of this. Uh, in the case of Jupiter, it shows it moving quite, quite fast, and Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are also moving extremely fast, but their banding is, isn't quite as complicated. What the big, the big question about Jupiter is what the heck is going on with that giant red spot? Uh, it is a cyclonic storm of sorts. Um, it used to be twice the size of the Earth. Now it's only about the size of the Earth, uh, which is still pretty big. Um, 
somewhere on, on the edges of that storm, the winds are about, oh, about 500 miles an hour. So that's a pretty strong storm. Not only that, but that storm is generating a great deal of heat. And a lot of scientists feel that the heat generated by that storm actually heats most of the planet. Again, looking at how the planet actually uh, rotates, uh, you can see it's, it's pretty complicated. And actually, it's a, it's, it really makes things interesting if you want to take interesting pictures of that. Because if you look on the upper left, I mean, that's one of the bands on Jupiter. And I think it looks neat. I mean, you can put that up on a wall and stare at it for days. Anyway, what, what would it be like to fall into Jupiter? What would it be like to uh, try to experience, uh, you know, what, what a life form would, would feel as you're falling into the bottom of Jupiter? First of all, if you just free fall into Jupiter, let's say from uh, Eo, Eo, the closest moon, by the time you reach the cloud tops, you are falling at more than 100,000 miles per hour. As you hit the denser atmosphere, it'll be like hitting a wall, but it won't be enough to stop you. After about three minutes, you'll reach the cloud tops, 155 miles down. And here you'll feel the full brunt of Jupiter's rotation. This creates powerful winds that will rip around the planet at more than 300 miles per hour. It's also getting a little warm, let's, let's face it. About 75 miles below the clouds, you'll reach the limit of human exploration. Uh, that's about where the Galileo probe made it when it dove into Jupiter's atmosphere. It only lasted about 58 minutes until the temperatures of pressure basically blew it apart. But down here, the pressure is about a hundred times what you would feel at the Earth's surface. And you won't be able to see anything because it'll be perfectly pitch dark. By 430 miles, the pressure is 1150 times higher than what you would experience on the Earth. You might survive this pressure if you were in a diving bell but it won't last too much longer as you're falling into the center of the planet. But let's say you can, you, you'll, you'll last and you'll go down even further. And here you'll uncover some of Jupiter's biggest mysteries. Sadly, you won't be able to tell anybody about it because the deep atmosphere absorbs radio waves. So you'll be shut off from the outside world. Once you've reached about 2,500 miles down, the temperature is equal to that of the surface of the sun. That's hot enough to melt tungsten, if you happen to have tungsten on you. Uh, at this point, uh, you will have been falling for 12 hours. And you won't even be halfway through. At 13,000 miles down, you've reached Jupiter's innermost layer. Here, the pressure is 2 million times stronger than the Earth's surface. And the temperature is way hotter than the sun. These conditions are so extreme, they change the chemistry of hydrogen. It's no longer a gas. At this point, hydrogen has become a metal because the, the tremendous pressures and temperatures and gravity 
have forced the electrons together. So even if you, even if you were using lights, you would never be able to see anything. It's as dense as a rock. So if you travel deeper, the buoyancy from the metallic hydrogen counteracts the gravity pulling you down. Eventually, that buoyancy will shoot you back until gravity overtakes you. And you'll be free floating in mid Jupiter, unable to move up or down, no way to escape. That's kind of sad, which is an awful lot different than what a scientist were talking about Jupiter, at least living up in the clouds. Uh, even in, in the 1960s, uh, Time Life books were talking about living blimps that would actually suck in the hydrogen and be able to use that as a fuel. So uh, definitely, life on Jupiter would not be and would would not be fun. But like the Earth. The weather on Jupiter is, is, has some similarities to the Earth. One of them is something called mush balls. Mush balls. Actually, this is melted ammonia. Gets covered with ice. And, well, it kind of works like hail, where you have a... Uh, a, a maybe a little uh, piece of dirt and and water starts to coalesce around the dirt and then the tremendous wind will actually cause this this drop this uh droplet of rain or or or, uh, or water to move up and down in the atmosphere causing it to keep on getting more water and becoming more and more frozen until finally the hail is big enough to overcome the updrafts and it falls to the ground. Well, the same thing happens with the ammonia and methane on Jupiter. It'll actually coalesce around some kind of ice and then move up and down in the, in the clouds until these mush balls are formed. And then with a downdraft, they will come down, they'll, uh, uh, the outer shells will evaporate, and then you'll, have, you'll get hit by a mush ball if you happen to be, um, well, even, even close to the, there's no surface on Jupiter. So if you're moving toward the lower part of the clouds. But if you were deeper, then something else happens because with methane, uh, you have a chance of making diamonds on Jupiter and Saturn. So does it rain diamonds on Jupiter and Saturn? And the answer is because of the methane, the possibility is there. So these planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, these will have methane-rich atmospheres. And during, when, when there are storms, lightning storms, uh, the methane will actually uh, burn into soot, into some kind of a carbon soot. And then this carbon soot will be, uh, will drop toward the surface of the planet where heat and pressure will change the soot into balls of graphite. And as the graphite falls further and further down to the surface or whatever uh, happens to be inside of Jupiter, this ball of graphite, because of the pressure, will actually change into diamonds. So if you want to get rich quick, I guess you fly to Jupiter and find some diamonds, but I don't think it'll work that way because I think you'll have something else 
at you. Well, I've been talking about life on Jupiter, and actually the whole point of this series was talking about uh, life, uh, life on the planets. And obviously on Jupiter, uh, we're just not going to find life you know, on, the, on the planet itself. So we need to look elsewhere in our solar system. And one of the places we need to look is at the moons going around these planets. The moons going around these planets have a better possibility of life than the planets themselves. Uh, in the mind of James Cameron, uh, who uh, directed not only Titanic, but also Avatar, uh, he shows how the moons of another planet could hold life. He called that planet, that moon, Pandora. And what's interesting is the fact that he used a backdrop that looks amazingly like Jupiter to show the mother planet that actually holds this, uh, this moon. And it's a very, very strong, and that as scientists have been taking a closer look at this, we find that it is a very definite possibility, but it's actually more than a possibility that there is life on these moons. So looking at our solar system, we find that there's 105 moons, I'm sorry, 205 moons, or 210 moons, if you count Pluto. And some of these moons are better suited for life than Mars is. You know, I remember a long time ago when Jupiter only had 12 moons. Of course, at that time, the solar system had nine planets. Well, anyway, let's stop talking about that. And as you can see, if we line up everything in size places, uh, you can see that there are some planets there. And you can see that Mars and Ganymede, which is one of the moons going around Jupiter, uh, are almost the same size. Titan is pretty close. Titan goes around Saturn. Then you have Mercury and Callisto. Mercury a planet and Callisto virtually the same size. So these are huge moons. In fact, our moon's just a little bit smaller than Eo. That's how that's pronounced, by the way. So uh, let's take a look at some of the moons. And we'll start off with the, uh, with the large moons of Jupiter. And here you have Europa, Eo, Callisto, and Ganymede. Now, for those of you who think this is just Boulder Dash, or whatever you want to call it, um, I memorized those names a long, long time ago. And as a result of me memorizing those names, I actually got an evening of free drinks at a convention. So it's important to memorize. memorize. Well, memorize if you think you might get free drinks at a convention. Anyway, well, let's take a look at EO, uh, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. They are the moons, the, called the Galilean moons, going around Jupiter. And as you can see, Jupiter has an awful lot more moons than that. I mean, Jupiter is just chock full of moons. And when we take a look at the Galilean moons or the inner moons of Jupiter, what we find is the fact that the closest moon, Eo, orbits the planet in about one, a little more than one and a half Earth days. Europa, about three and a half Earth days. Ganymede, about a little more than seven days. And Callisto, in about 16, almost 17 days. So 
So those are the 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 Galilean moons, and if we if we take them and we cut them in half, we find that they have iron-rich cores. They have, with the exception of Eo, uh, they have oceans within the the the, uh, the mantle of these moons, and uh, they're an interesting. That's an they're interesting moons because they're kind of built like a planet. Now the first, the, the closest uh, moon to Jupiter is Eo, and Eo has no water. In fact, Eo barely has a solid surface. The surface is constantly changing. And the reason why it's changing is because the moon being so close to Jupiter is actually being needed by the gravitational tidal effects of Jupiter. Think of it as a ball and you're squeezing it in two directions. As a result, the planet itself is semi-molten, which causes a great deal of volcanoes. And we can see these volcanoes. Surface of, of EO is quite high. Uh, maybe somewhere in the vicinity of oh, somewhere around 3,000 degrees. And it shoots these, sulf actually it's sulfur type lava, it shoots it more than 250 miles into its atmosphere. Now, again, the reason why EO is so hot is because the gravitational effects of Jupiter are actually causing it to knead. And as it kneads, it heats up. If you want to see how much something heats up, you know, you take a piece of metal and you bend it really quick. And as you bend it, if you touch where the metal is bending, it'll be extremely hot. The next moon out is Europa. And Europa definitely looks like there's something going on. It looks like a dessert that you poured caramel on. But I can tell you that it's not caramel. It's the sixth closest moon to the giant planet. And it actually has a better possibility of life than Mars. In fact, it's considered to be the best place for life to, 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 to come into existence uh, outside of the Earth in our solar system. Now, when I'm talking about life, I'm not talking about you and me. I'm talking about microbial life, or in some case, something called extremophiles. And we all know what an extremophile is. It's those funny little water bears uh, that could live in outer space or places where there's no water and, and under tremendous temperatures and radiation. This is, this is possibly the type of animal that could live on Europa. So if we take a look at it, first of all, Europa actually has more water than the Earth. I mean, that's in all this water is actually sitting under the surface of a crusty layer of ice. Now, the big question is, why does Europa even have water? Don't you need sunlight? Don't you need the sun to be able to have liquid water? I mean, isn't that why they set up the habitable zones? Well, actually, Europa has something else going for it. It is close enough to Jupiter where the tidal effects of Jupiter will actually heat the planet. And as a result of heating the planet, it will turn this heat into thermal energy. And 
as a result on the bottom of these ice layers that are uh, that are on the, uh, uh, the core side of the planet. There are thermal vents that will release gases and heat and just like the thermal vents on the earth and that is a place where life possibly could exist. It won't be using photosynthesis simply because it's just plain too dark. However, we'll be using something called chemosynthesis, which is where it will actually use the chemicals, hydrogen, methane, this type of stuff, to be able to use those chemicals to go through uh, some type of metabolism. Now, the big question is, what about the tremendous radiation that Jupiter gives off? What about that? Won't that destroy any kind of life that is being, uh, that's being born on these moons? And the answer to that is, yeah, if it's on the surface of that moon. But if you dig down maybe about eight to 10 inches, you will be protected by the tremendous radiation that Jupiter gives off. So this is a good place for extremophiles. Now, how did they, how did they figure this out? Well, it seems that they were uh, one of the probes that went out to Jupiter, uh, I think it was Galileo, actually flew through one of the plumes that happened to be being blasted off of Europa. And a technician probably doing uh, midnight work happened to find some of, that, uh, uh, some of that information. And it had the same uh, 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 markings as water. And she made the results, she made the, uh, the report saying that she found water on Europa. So the detection of, uh, of this plume was where the scientists decided that maybe Europa needs to have a second look. And right now, there are missions being planned to go to Europa, land on the, on the moon, and take a close look. Ganymede and Callisto, while they have ices and water, uh, probably don't quite have the all the materials, all the the uh, uh, items needed to uh, have extremophiles be able to live on that. Next planet out is Saturn. And it's similar to Jupiter, but given its density, if you had a bathtub big enough, you would find that Saturn actually floats. And one of the things I have looked for time and time again is some kind of a squeeze toy of Saturn, where if you squeeze it, it goes, wee, wee, wee. Wouldn't that be neat, have a squeezable Saturn that would float, I, I'm probably making, um, making too much of that. <clears throat> I know that there are some dogs that would enjoy that. Anyway, uh, Saturn has had its picture taken uh, for um, 100, 100 plus years. And this is probably the best picture of Saturn that I have seen. And when this picture was taken, it was actually taken by Cassini probe that went out there. Um, they noticed something. Did you know that somewhere in that picture, there's the Earth? The Earth is in that picture. Now, I don't think you'll find it easily 
because it's almost microscopic on this distance. I'll give you some help. There it is. That's the Earth. And so when you uh, compare, I mean, the Earth is at this particular point is somewhere in the vicinity of about, uh, oh, what would that be? About 10 million, more than that, about 10, 12 million miles away. Uh, yeah, that's uh, more, yeah, more than that. It's about a billion miles away. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's a good picture. Um, I wonder if they're all waving, knowing that they're taking, being taken a picture. Actually, the, what's interesting is the fact that the rings are a relatively new feature to the planet. They're only about, maybe about 100 million years old. And they're not going to last forever. Uh, you know, how scientists will take something and they'll name the heck out of it. And they've done that with Saturn's rings. There's the D ring, C ring, B ring, A ring, F ring, G ring, E ring. Uh, they've, they've discovered more rings than that. So they have all sorts of rings going out. And they've also found that Saturn is actually raining onto the surface of the planet parts of its ring. And it's, it's raining somewhere in the vicinity of about, oh, what was that be? About 10,000 kilograms per hour. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. 10,000 kilograms per second. That's fast enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in an hour. So it's losing its ring at the rate of 10,000 kilograms per second, which means it might last another hundred million years. So at some point in the future, the rings will disappear and we'll have a dull planet. The rings are actually held in place, at least some of the rings are actually held in place by some of the little moonlets that go around the planet. They, these are called shepherding moons and they keep the rings in place. As you can see, there are gravitational effects after the moon passes by. And if we take a look at the major moons that are circling Saturn, as you can see, they, they all have little names to them. There's Prometheus and Helene, and way out in left field, you have Titan. And taking a look at some of the moons, you can see that the only moon there that seems to be different and seems to be somewhat interesting is Titan. It's the one that has an atmosphere. Now, they didn't know what kind of atmosphere was on it, but they decided that it does need to be looked at. So in 1997, a probe was launched that did some amazing things. The name of the probe was Cassini. It was launched October 15th, 1997. This will give an idea how big it was. And this is what it did. It had cameras. It had all sorts of analyzing equipment on there. Uh, 
I liked the way they named everything. A power supply they called food. They had a baby on it, which was named Huygens. Uh, that's the probe that actually went to Titan. And again, uh, it was sent into a highly elliptical orbit. The elliptical orbit uh, had it uh, grazing the outside of the rings. And the final orbits, they actually changed the aspect of it. So it actually went in between the ring and the planet. And as you can see, it passed by Titan a number of times. One of the things that Cassini found was something so totally unexpected that there's no way of explaining this thing. It just, it's not supposed to exist. And that is the pole of the uh, uh, polar region on Saturn. They have no idea what type of physical uh, uh, attribute that is on this planet that causes the polar region to go hexagonal. It, I mean, you, you can't make the weather turn corners, but here it's doing that. Meanwhile, in the center of this, there is a constant, a very high velocity of vortex. So they have no idea what is causing the hexagonal clouds that is making this, this vortex. In 2017, uh, Cassini was lowered into Saturn's atmosphere where it burned up. So there's, it's no longer orbiting that planet. But it did not leave the planet. Actually, the planet was not empty handed after Cassini left. Because sitting on Titan, uh, a robot landed. This was carried by Cassini. Right there. And this little robot, name of this robot was Huygens, and it actually landed on the surface of Titan. It found, before it went, it found that it did have a relatively thick atmosphere, but there was absolutely no water on that moon. And it was uh, you know, strapped into that little uh, robot were instruments that were designed to measure the atmosphere and send back pictures of the surface of Titan. Before that particular probe left Cassini, uh, Cassini photographed every aspect of that moon. It found that there was a hazy atmosphere that actually uh, extended uh, several miles into the Titan atmosphere. And when it did land, it took some amazing pictures. So it parachuted down. And as it did, it took panoramic pictures of its surroundings. As it got closer, uh, the surface got more rough, uh, mountains and hills, until finally it was only about uh, oh, maybe about a thousand miles up. This was the last picture it took before it finally landed on the moon 
And when it landed on the moon, this is what it looked like. So here's the, one of the first pictures of the surface of Titan taken by Huygens. And it reveals a very rocky surface. As it went through the atmosphere, it showed that it was nitrogen rich, there was methane in there, uh, ethane, and there was a strong haze. The rain that was raining down to the surface was actually liquid methane. And it, it's caused, a, there was a lot of talk about this. First of all, let me kind of explain to you what the picture is. This is a very, very foreshortened picture. The rocks in front are extremely close to the camera, while the rocks in back are closer to the horizon. So you can see that the rocks in front are about a, a centimeter or two in diameter. As you get further and further back, uh, you find rocks that are much bigger until finally at the horizon, uh, the rocks are actually the size of boulders. The picture in the middle is actually the direct picture of the surface, and you can see that there is, it's just covered with haze. And then on the picture on the right, we are comparing a lake on Titan to a lake on the Earth, and they're very similar. One thing which they didn't count on was the fact that there is a hydrologic cycle on the planet. In other words, like the Earth, where we have rain that will evaporate, form clouds, and then it rains again, the same thing happens on Titan. Only it's not rain like we know it, it's actually methane. It's liquid methane. And as a result, we will have methane lakes that will evaporate, form clouds in the Titan sky, and then it'll rain methane onto the surface. They also found that the lakes on Titan undergo tides just like the Earth. Given time, it shows how the liquid or the methane lakes will actually rise and fall given its position around the planet. So in order to have liquid methane, Titan is a very cold place. The liquid methane and ethane, it's full of nitrogen, but scientists look at hydrogen cyanide in the atmosphere and speculate that it could become a chemical called poly, polyamide on the surface, which is what they call prebiotic chemistry. So there might be a form of life on this moon. And again, with the clouds uh, actually raining uh, methane onto the surface, rather than asking for ammonia, this life form might be asking for cyanide. Anyway, that, that's according to our Cornell College, our Cornell University paper. So the temperatures on Titan are much too cold for liquid water. But water could still be found on the bottom of craters, possibly where energy cannot reach. It'll be uh, probably a, a liquid, I'm sorry, water ice. And the, uh, the, the water might form there, uh, might condense 
out of the chemistry that is falling onto the surface of Titan, but it certainly wouldn't last very long. Meanwhile, they've taken the pictures of Titan's surface and they've made better pictures uh, of what the surface of Titan looks like. So there could be some type of uh, microbial life on Titan. It would definitely be uh, something that would be that would go into the extremophile file. Uh, but while they were looking at this, uh, the people who were controlling Cassini found a real surprise. While Cassini was passing by Encephalus, it actually ran into a water plume. But it wasn't just any water plume. It was a water plume that was actually very close to the chemical makeup of our water. This basically blew the pants off of the, uh, the scientists who were controlling Cassini. So they actually changed the course of the probe and had it go through a plume again, just to make sure of what they were looking at. <coughs> They found that Encephalus was undergoing tidal forces, just like the other moons were. And as a result, it was storing energy. The red on this is actually infrared, and it shows the buildup of energy under the surface. And as a result, the energy will release tremendous amounts of water that will fly high, actually several hundred miles into the skies around this moon. And as it does that, uh, it'll cause, uh, again, the thermal events with, within the planet where they has the, the, the ocean of this, of this moon is actually in between the core and an ice layer. And within this ocean, this dark ocean, the possibility of life is there because these thermal vents are giving off energy and gases that would be able to feed a, uh, an extremophile. And as it does that, uh, Encephalus could, could have life going around it. And as this little moon goes around the planet, it actually drops off lots and lots of water as it orbits the planets. And these, this water, these, these ice particles, that were formerly water on the surface or actually under the surface of this moon actually becomes a part of Saturn's ring where given time it'll eventually evaporate or fall to the surface of Saturn. It's hoped that when we do find alien life, that they'll welcome us. We really do, we, we, we hope that they will welcome us. We hope we don't end up like this. Yeah, let's, uh, let's not become someone else's dinner. Anyway, Next week, Uranus and Neptune. Until Voyager passed by these planets, they were considered to be the Ditto sisters. One was just like the other, and we've learned that they're not. <laughs>